So I'm here with my friend, uh, my dear friend, and we've been friends for many years now, and I consider her to be one of the most amazing people I've ever met. Her skillfulness in non-ordinary experience and some magical traditions is quite profound, and I'm just really excited to be having this chance to talk with you, so... Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here with you and have a little chat and we'll see what happens. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, <laughs> um, I feel like a little kid at Christmas time. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to begin by asking you about some of your early experiences as a child. And so, so I want to start with that, but I also want to ask um, perhaps a little bit further on in the conversation about what the what the religious and or spiritual atmosphere was like in your family. But if we mm -hmm. could just start with some of your earliest memories of things yeah. that were inexplicable. Mm -hmm. So, oh, um, when I was a very, very small child, I mean, like a baby, we spent time at my great grandmother's house in what we call up north in northern Wisconsin. And that was like the family homestead, essentially. And my family uh, come from a line of spiritualists. So they also incorporated like parts of Christianity into um, their their own sort of workings, I'll call them workings. And so um, the people in the neighborhood knew that they did different types of healings and so forth. There are stories of them being up in the attic, people walking up in the attic and not being able to see and coming down and being able to see, going up in the attic and not being able to hear, coming down from the attic and being able to hear. And so I, as a baby, um, spent time in that house with that family and with my family, with my greater family, essentially. And, um, you know, it didn't seem really unusual because that's what I grew up with, right? And so um, the only thing that was creepy, you know, like creepy in the, in the family thing is, is there was always a, um, what I now understand to be a crystal ball on the, um, the Davenport and uh, in the living room. And, you know, I never really knew what it was um, until I got older. And then when I tried to give it away to a great aunt, she said, no, I'm not allowed to get rid of it because then I'd be cursed. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, mm, okay, I guess. So it's, it's in my ancestor shelf in my house. <laughs> oh, wow. You have it still. Oh, yeah. I still have it. I, and there's um, something inside that, isn't there? Yeah, there's a hand with a rose, holding a rose inside of it. So, yeah. Um, and then uh, my that aunt, that same aunt actually had mentioned, oh, well, I have the family spell book. And so um, I got some pages of it. It was written in low German and then translated by a Catholic priest uh, in English. And so it's kind of interesting because I have just a few, maybe eight or nine pages of it. And there's a lot of, like, it does not look like a regular, you know, you know, eye of newt and <laughs> grimoire. <laughs> <Yeah. Right. laughs> You know, there's a, it's really sort of like lines of, almost lines of poetry, religious poetry, and then incorporates, you know, some weird stuff that, um, uh, and even things that are just X'd out and the blood of sheep and things like that. So there's like, there's some weirdness into it and a lot of symbol, uh, symbol, uh, symbols and um, you know, just different kinds of language that you know something's a little little off. And I think that's how people back then kept their life, essentially. You know, if you were known to um, do things, especially like healings or work with herbs or things like that, um, you have to be a little careful about it and sometimes quiet about it. And so you don't want to necessarily... 
um, have incriminating evidence um, that's easily to see. So um, that kind of stuff. But for me, you know, that was um, just growing up. I didn't really know anything different. Um, you know, I, it wasn't until I got to be about maybe like five or six years old when I understood that, oh, other people aren't having foretelling dreams or, oh, other people can't actually see that thing in the corner over there, you know, and, and that kind of stuff. Um, my family, uh, it depended on who it was in the family. So like, for instance, my birth mother didn't have any issue with any of the, um, you know, non-ordinary kind of things. My stepmother, my aunt, uh, after my mom passed, I lived with my stepmom, who was my mom's sister. She did not want to hear anything at all about it didn't want to talk about it. My grandmother on the maternal side, however, you know, the mom of both of them was completely comfortable with it. And of course, a great grandma and all that. So it just depended on who it was and how far they wanted to go with it. Um, but, you know, it there's funny incidences that can happen. So, uh, you know, one of my aunts, for instance, has uh, trouble with something and then decides to uh, go to bed and because her emotional state was kind of like wild you know she was angry and upset and just overly emotional you, when we uh, went to bed all of the cabinets start opening and closing and the you know the front door starts moving and things like that we're like oh that's just how she is you know <laughs> <laughs> I had a period of that too um, when I was in my probably my mid thirties. And I was in a really stressful scenario and I'd go over to a friend's house and I'd say, could you please turn on the bathroom light? You know? And they're like, why? And I'd say, because I'll pop them out. I'll blow the light out if I touch the light switch. And they're like, ha ha ha, you know? <laughs> go ahead. You know? And I'm like, um, okay, pop, you know, <laughs> just, what are you going to do? You know, those are just the things. So Huh. Uh, flying at uh, computers and flying at airports, all those things become a little bit more tricky when you're in that kind of state where it's an unstable mental state where you're emotional and that emotional energy can sort of get kinetic. It's sort of like how um, teenage kids get, you know, stuff around them tends to get a little wild if they're emotionally distraught and they they're bent a little bit you know they have that capacity so yeah do you same find thing. that capacity more common with females than males mm -mm. Ah. I think I think actually in from like a teenage time I think uh boys are more common with like the uh the kineticness of the movement of energy you know I feel that it wears out or mo for most of the time it wears down after a period of time as people get older and they become a little bit more integrated with their emotions and things like that. But I mean, you know, puberty is a rough time. Teenage years are a rough time and there's a lot of emotions that go with that. So, but yeah, I think, um, I, I, I mean, I'm an equal opportunity for it. I think it could be, you know, male or female, but from, you know, um, just come in conversations with other people and so forth. It seems like boys uh, tend to have more of that. Well, oh, that's interesting. I may have had that bias just because perhaps I have gravitated more towards women as friends. Mm -hmm. So in my youth, many of my friends were female and I never heard reports from males of this, but I pretty regularly heard them from females. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. And it could be also, you know, the societal um, stipulations involved with that of what's acceptable and not acceptable or what's shameful or what constitutes providing, you know, like a guilty feeling about it or, you know, or openness toward having those kinds of conversations. Because yeah. most people generally don't want to have, you know, uh, conversations where they look vulnerable or weird, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's true, but the women, at least among themselves, they seem to be more likely to share this. But again, it depends on the cohort, right? Like mm -hmm. 
if yeah. the cohort's sort of ethos allows for this without shame, shaming, and so on, then then I suppose it's much more likely to um, to to be expressed. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So give me a couple of scenes from your youth where something that that really made an impact on you and changed how you thought about. <laughs> so. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm getting over COVID. I'm so glad. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, so the stuff I say, you know, it's going to end up with people going, are you sure you didn't bring in a lunatic, Darren, to this conversation? <laughs> yes, I know you, but, but I know you. The reality yeah. a little bit. <laughs> There's always this concern, <clears throat> right. but um, in, in my other interviews, for example, with my friend Ryan First Diver, who's a Blackfoot beaver man, we're talking about a 10,000 year old tradition. And in, in, mm -hmm. you know, my friend Mark, who spent 10 years in Africa, we're talking about traditions that are thousands of years old. Yeah. And so I think my viewers are unlikely to be too quick to just make wild, you know, <laughs> judgments. And I know you well enough, like, we sort of, when we met, we kind of vetted each other a bit. Yeah, see. we did for a while, didn't we? Yeah, <laughs> and I had just the absolute sense that this is a sincere, authentic human being who's highly intelligent and sensitive. I trust you. So mm -hmm. some of that will will buffer out any wild <laughs> concerns, I think. But yeah, I, I'm really excited actually to hear these <laughs> things, right? The things okay. that you experienced that left a big impression on you and perhaps mm -hmm. changed how you saw yourself and perhaps your role in life and so on. So please. Sure. Yeah. So there's an example of when actually my sister, there were a bunch of family members in the living room. Uh, my sister was maybe like four and I was maybe six and we were in the living room my parents were in there and I think my grandparents were in there and uh near the fireplace in that um living area there was this small squat kind of creature that was wiggling you know back and forth and sort of making faces at my sister and I and I look at my sister and I was like you see that? And she's like, I see that. And then we look around and we were going to say like, hey, anyone else see that? And we realized everybody else in the room was room was completely stopped emotion. Like they were like it, like we were between the seconds, essentially, like they were completely still like animated stuck. Right. Wow. And, and my sister and I were both like still able to communicate with each other and look at that thing. And we we're like, I've never seen anything like that. Have you seen, you know, you know, we're just talking about it and it's in the corner doing its thing. Everyone is still still. And then um, I think my sister and I were just like, hey, go. And then, you know, like we sort of like pushed it out of like wanting it to leave. Like our intent was for it to leave. Now, I wouldn't have used those kinds of that kind of language being six years old. We were just like, you know, get, you know, kind of thing <laughs> because what concerned me more uh, was actually that the family wasn't moving more so than the creature in the in in the fireplace area the same with my sister you know and so it did go and as soon as it left then everybody else was moving again mm -hmm. and I sort of my sister and I would talk about it you know not like oh my god that was a life-changing experience but just like wasn't that weird you know and sort of moved on with things and it wasn't until um, that I was actually starting my training with the uh, makers that we were going back into like, what's a weird experience, but go back and, and take a look at that energetically and see what was going on, that I realized, oh, I think we really were like stuck in like some kind of time shift or something, you know, like there was a, there was another like like the, the worlds had sort of just sort of collided for a moment and we were able to see, but in the, in our world, in, uh, in, you know, the earth world, whatever, uh, th that was just this, you know, millisecond kind of moment. Whereas my sister and I were in a moment that made it stretch out, you know, longer. And so we were able to see this animated. So it was, it was kind of really interesting to experience like two phases of 
what we call time happening at the same time, you know, essentially having, having that experience, I think was um, really eye opening for me, uh, because it helped me later with understanding things like the nature of rocks and their time frames, uh, the nature of, you know, like old uh, sequoias and things like that, where um, everything and and the time frame of something like a mayfly, right, where it's only around for a day, well, what we call a day. And so like how these beings experience time in such different ways, um, it, it's more accessible to me, I feel, because I've had that experience. Yeah, that's so that's really, an example. Um, can you describe what you saw? So, <laughs> yeah, it, I, hmm. so my sister and I, you know, I've talked about it over the years because you always wonder, like, does your memory sort of shift things? And so, like, maybe because your memory, well, for me, it tends to want to put things into a language that I understand, right? Like the symbols I know or the what other kinds of things. But mm. this was just so completely out of it. It just looked like, um, it looks like a little sort of dancing fat elf in a way, really. You know, it had a face. Um, I've seen other things that don't have faces. So I would say, you know, I had sort of like this sort of human-ish kind of face and human-ish kind of body um uh but it, it just had it kept like grimace like making this kind of like weird smile face and then uh going ah, 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 you know <laughs> not really words but just grunting kind of sound uh so it was it was yeah it was kind of interesting was it wearing clothes um it wore sort of like a i don't know that i would call it clothes I guess, you know, it, it had more like a black uh, covering over it, I guess mm. is what I would say. And a black thing above its head too, so. And did its skin have a color? Um, yeah, its skin was like a, like a grayish white color. Mm. Yeah. And did it show teeth? Um, I would say that it did, but it wasn't any kind of like fangs or teeth, you know, like pointy teeth or anything. Um, and it just had, it did have a mouth. Um, and then I'm, you know, at that point, then I could have entrapple, uh, you know, entrapolated that, oh, they had teeth behind it. Sure. So, did yeah. you see its ears? No, no, I didn't see any ears. Had a nose? Uh, yes, it had it like, like what I would call like um, the old timey crooked witch's nose, or it ah. sort of it and came out. <laughs> <clears throat> I don't know if it was more beakish or whatever, but yeah, it was sort of interesting. I don't want to lose the thread, but what you said about time is incredibly important. Um, ordinary people think about time in a very naive way. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about the difference between, for example, the sequoia and the mayfly, mm -hmm. something very profound there. But I think the thing that even when we think in those terms tends to escape us is that there's a symphony of relationships mm -hmm. that each have different temporalities, right? The mayfly may relate with the sequoia. And so mm -hmm. there's a third domain between them mm -hmm. in yeah. which very elaborate temporal music and also relation is always occurring in nature. Mm -hmm. um, also, it, it's this is just a topic that fascinates me endlessly and perhaps more so over the past six years. So we may return to it. Yeah, sure. Um, but give us another one. Mm, another really like super early kind of thing, right? So yeah. um, the first like time where I recognized that I was foretelling things and dreaming uh, was when I was about five years old. And um, at that time, I had a dream that there was like this kind of evil thing that was chasing me and my grandfather around one of those old timey um, alarm clocks, you know, with the kinds with the little legs and the, the things. And so we were running around and this thing was chasing us. And eventually it got my grandfather. It didn't get me, but it got my grandfather. 
And my grandfather died a couple of days later. And wow. I, t- at that point, even as young as I was, I recognized, I'm like, oh, something evil was going to happen to my grandfather, you know, something dark or bad or was going to happen to my grandfather. And then he died. And so then I was like, oh, there's a relationship to what I'm seeing in my dreams to what's happening in this world. And um, it was not comfortable. You know, that wasn't a comfortable first time experience or the first time that I correlated those things together. And, um, you know, some dreams I never really have a lot of like when I have foretelling dreams, they're not really like super great. Like, you know, Darren just won the the Pulitzer Prize or anything. (laughs) It's more so like, oh, your friend is going to get into a car accident or, you know, other kinds of terrible stuff like that. And so uh, I had to learn how to navigate um, how to not freak people out about that. Right. Because if I said, Darren, I had a dream that you're that you got into a car crash and and you and you knowing me that that's probably going to really happen. You know, what good is that? Right. Like, first of all, it's not helpful. You know, you're going to be worried. Um, Can you have any, you know, then your question is, what kind of control do you have over um, modifying that kind of thing, um, you know, that all of those kinds of things would happen. And so after time, I finally learned, hey, Darren, remember, buckle up when you drive home. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, in direction. Yeah. Right. right. And so I would work it out. And then later on, and I'm talking about many years later, I learned that you could, um, I don't know what, what you would call it, uh, what the term would be, but you could enact that dream in this world uh, in a fake way, but Mm -hmm. energetically it would still finish, the intent would still complete. And so it would sort of wipe the slate clean. So like if I knew you were going to be in a dream Mm -hmm. that, or if I knew you were going to be in a car crash, then, um, and I didn't want you to be in that car crash. I could, you know, make, put you in a chair and give you a little fake steering wheel and then enact that it happened, enact what happened in that dream. And that sort of like uh, clears it from actually happening in this world because, and I, and I heard there was some kind of, uh, I don't know what kind of studies or whatever that people who think through, um, think certain things that 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 their mind doesn't know the difference between the reality and that thinking of it happening I guess and so maybe Mm -hmm. there's some correlation with that but that's what I found the hard way or long way I should say (laughs) you know that's a crucially important insight that I I don't want to gloss over um there are very few people who would imagine or engage with dreams in such a way that they might play them out in their waking life. Yeah. From what I understand, um, Mark Twain was fond of having a dream exchange with people in his house in the morning. And after the exchange, he would go into a room by himself and play out the dreams with him inhabiting the different roles of the people in the dream. Mm -hmm. And that's an interesting example of a very precocious intelligence, obviously, right? Yeah. but a very powerful idea i think we're um i think we're missing a lot obviously in modern times we're missing a lot of just meaningful time together excuse me but we're missing a lot when we when we're not able to share what we've been dreaming about and there may be situations in which that's not the best idea but generally speaking the humans i think for millions of years right or many many lifetimes one of the things they would always do is get together and sort of use each other's dreams to get a read on, Hey, what's, what's happening in not necessarily the magical world, but in the world that informs the one that we wake up to, right? Something like this. Mm -hmm. So precognitive dreams, how about anything resembling an out of body experience or. Well, I would say, I mean, yeah, I I had those things, but um, I didn't, I didn't know they weren't 
usual. Like I didn't know that they were not, uh, that that was unusual, you know? Uh -huh. So I didn't really make a big deal about it. And I, I guess I still don't, you know, um, it's hard to explain, you know, when you're, <laughs> you don't know you're weird until you're with someone who's not weird. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> it's true, right? I mean, that's actually, that's a very protective thing in a way, right? Because you don't have the feeling that this isn't supposed to happen. Yeah. And so that gives you degrees of liberty that, that are unavailable to people who are busy thinking like, you know, why is this happening to me or, or something like this? Yeah. And maybe some of that is from the way that I grew up, right? Like I lived with a family that that kind of stuff was just whatever. It was just a typical thing. Um, and there wasn't really any direction uh, or, or training or anything like that, you know, like, um, and there wasn't any sort of like suppression of it either, even though my grandmother, I don't know what my great grandmother was, it, what her religion was, but my grandmother on that maternal side uh, was Catholic, like hardcore Catholic, right? Mm. And so I was brought up through the Catholic church, um, but I didn't necessarily you know, jive with it. I just did it because, oh, you know, other people are going and whatever. And so I ended up more like if I were to um, say, well, if I had to pick a religion, it'd either be, you know, agnostic or whatever. But otherwise, I follow um, a Rinza, a Japanese Rinzai Zen tradition for Buddhism. So um, and Buddhists might say that Buddhism isn't necessarily a religion. I've heard both sides of that. So, you know, it's more of, you can incorporate Buddhist principles into other kinds of religions. Catholics love to do it, for instance. So with meditation and guided meditation and things like that, or being present, present moment kind of stuff, depending on your flavor of Buddhism that you might ascribe to. But um, yeah, like I wasn't ever, uh, necessarily um brought down or you know told not to talk about it or to talk about it there was just nothing really um uh unusual about it you know if and i think that helped me because i didn't have any sense of guilt or shame or repression or anything that might drive that down uh that aspect of myself down um you know my sister is a very good death walker you know she's very good at working uh and speaking to dead people and um very good at um her interaction and relationship with nature and so forth you know i feel like everybody has different skill sets and so forth my, you know, one other family member might be more good at uh, psychokinesis kind of stuff, like moving things, you know, in this layer. Um, I find myself pretty good at um, seeing and healing and also having a connection with my ancestors for uh, things like herbal remedies, or I need something, you know, kind of thing. And then speaking with the ancestors to get that um uh um answer you know it's very practical very practical mm -hmm. you know there isn't a whole lot of like you know um you should explore what the um environment of saturn is like you know <laughs> stuff there wasn't any much there isn't use for it you know it's more like oh well I feel um, connected with the wind and I look at the clouds and I can read the clouds and I can tell that the scout wind came through and inform the rest of the, you know, the natural beings in the area that that rain is going to come through in about eight to 10 hours. And, you know, that kind of stuff, the more of those kinds of things seemed more practical for me to spend my time learning about. Was there ever, sense? I'm sorry. Does that make sense? Yes, very much so. <laughs> um, so part of what you're saying is it would be helpful for any group of people who were together and committed to something to have one or two or more of them that have the special ability to see into 
what we could just you know circle with the term non-ordinary uh, mm -hmm. reality and also um when something is stuck right mm -hmm. or there's a special need mm -hmm. then that person can use their skillfulness to unstick that mm -hmm. or um bring resources that could surround that need and resolve mm -hmm. it in some way okay. that's positive and in some sense healthy rather mm -hmm. than it becoming very dire right, right. absolutely right? rather than the need turning into something much more um sticky yeah you know? mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah it's so, like is like my sister I spoke with her a couple of weeks ago she lives about three hours north of me up in the in the woods right mm. and she has this concern about oh what if it something happens like we're having some solar uh flares what if emfs happen or something and I can't get a hold of you I said well it's super easy we'll just contact each other in dreaming you know and then we can just you know figure out what we need to do in dreaming if you need help or I need help or whatever and you know so that's practical to me right yes like, that's just how you can do it then so that way um you know it, it's much easier to pick up a cell phone <laughs> you know mm -hmm. <laughs> because you can keep going but um dreaming works also you know as an example that's a really important thing you've mentioned and i have a few sort of questions that i've bookmarked but very briefly um Is it clear to you that before the humans had something like radio, the technology that they were doing something like that with their dreaming minds or their non-ordinary aspect commonly? Absolutely. I feel that that was a skill that's been lost and we've lost that for, for many people, you know, like yes. the average person has lost that. First of all, it happens, there's there's several ways to get in contact with other people, right? Like, so um, I could go into your dreams, for instance, and leave um, symbols or tell you stories or have a straight up conversation with you, depending on how your energy would take, take me coming into your dreams, right? So if you were frightened by the thought of me interrupting your dreams and getting into your privacy, then I might send symbols or something that is meaningful to you or set up a trigger, for instance, in your dreaming for, for that kind of intent to be fulfilled, right? Or to direct. get that knowledge through. Direct yeah. versus indirect. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's also the form that um, you and I both go into, uh, I call it awake dreaming, but you can do it in, in sleep dreaming too. Awake dreaming to me, when I speak that language, I'm talking about what my people call um, uh, journeying, um, astral travel, you know, whatever kind of thing. Basically, your your energy moves into another space and and can experience other kinds of experiences hmm. while the body is still in in you know this space and time, for instance. In the way, so, <clears throat> away, right, right. Yeah. So. So say you and I are going to go into awake dreaming and we're we're going to meet in a another place in another space and time, I would call it maybe like um, a node, for instance, right? And so um, it's a place that we both energetically understand where it is because we have inherently created a groove to that place with our energy. And so our energy is familiar with it. All we need is the cue of like, oh yeah, let's go to that old, um, you know, um, car lot in wherever it is. And so we can go there and end that place. Then we can have, we can interact and have those conversations or whatever we need to do, right? But it's not in this space and time necessarily. Um, there are, there's even like, um, uh, you can do this with like, for instance, one of the fun things I would do with my husband is, uh, you can, um, go in different spaces in the same, uh, or at different times in the same space. Mm. So for instance, I would say, Hey, Kurt, go hide somewhere in your childhood, like go hide somewhere in 
you know, some place where you were when you were a child. And so then I would jump and look and find him like in his old house, um, in, you know, the, um, uh, underneath the, the sink, right. In, in a little laundry basket or something, you know, <laughs> hidden in there or something. So you can do that kind of thing too, where you're just moving in, uh, different times within the same space, or you can move, uh, out of this whole time and space and meet in a completely other space, but then share the same time and space really in a, in a different place completely, or in dreaming, you can, you know, um, I, I can meet you in dreaming wherever you are too. So, you know, there's all different ways that you can inter interact. It really just depends on maybe how that person has already practiced or is comfortable with, or maybe what they grew up learning or learned to do through whatever traditions they picked up, you know? Um, and then really, if it's more natural to them uh, or uh, something they've been trained. So, yeah. Was there any skill transfer within your family where one of the, someone taught you something? Yeah. Um, No, it was just mostly uh, because my great, I would have loved, and I still, now I do, now I do because they're ancestors. Um, like with my great, great grandma and grandpa who were healers um, and her herbalists and so forth. And so I've learned a lot from them. Like uh, I'm, it's kind of interesting though, because I don't know necessarily the words they're using, but they show me like um, a friend got hurt and they said, oh, just go get some of those plants that grow in the cracks of the sidewalk. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, well, they're also on grass. Go get some of those, mush them up and put them in like a, you know, like a make them wet and warm and throw them in a wash in a like a cheesecloth and then put it on the wound and it'll suck the um, the poison out or whatever, you know, suck the, the infection out. Mm. And then I'm like, oh, plantain. And then you know, so I do it and then it works. And then I'm like, oh, that's super cool. And then I look it up and then I'm like, oh yeah, it's a thing. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that kind of stuff. And so it's kind of fun. I learned backwards, for instance, um, you know, like I had learned how to make what was what some people may call a witch's ladder. I never called it a witch's ladder. I didn't know you would call it a witch's ladder, but I just knew that if I made these things and put them in this way, uh, I could get, um, you know, the interaction of the, the air and the wind and the earth all moving together in to push this intent through, right? And so I would see a picture of it and I'm like, oh, I know what that, what is that? What do you, you know, like I've made one of those, what is that for? And they're like, oh, it's a witch's ladder, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, okay. That's what there's the words then that come. I, so I don't necessarily know um, how to, how to really be articulate about it until after other people provide the context to it. Yeah. And of course the articulation is rarely the important thing. That's sort of the the human group cultural yeah. pointers, right? Mm -hmm. But the knowledge is um, perhaps even more profound without the pointers. In a mm -hmm. way, once things become conceptualized or systematized, there's a tend, it doesn't necessarily, excuse me, um, create a problem, but there's a tendency for the humans in general, and maybe even for me, maybe I'm talking about myself, to attach to the representation, mm -hmm. it's often mm -hmm. sort of dead inside, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas the actual, the insight of when you first discover, oh, this is what I, I'm making of this, and mm -hmm. it does these things, and then you make it, and you have the experience of it, and you don't have the words, mm -hmm. and then the experience seems to me to be often so much more vital. Not, there's exceptions, right? It's not mm -hmm. black or white. What is a witch's ladder? It's basically a piece of string with some feathers on it. And uh, some for me, I put, sometimes I'll put bells on it or rocks to kind of keep it weighted. And then um, the feathers are tied to the string. And so it just looks like um, 
like feathers tied to a long string, for instance, I guess. Um, but um, do you do anything to the string? Um, I personally don't. Hmm. You know, I'm pretty, but you know, but there, one of those things. Speaking about like string, is, and this is kind of funny because I've learned that some of those things translate across different traditions, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I have always done. Uh, without any thinking about it is I've always made little ropes with knots in them and then hung them in trees or hung them on, on my car or hung them on things where I didn't want the spirits to necessarily bother that that thing right and it wasn't until and I don't know why like I don't I didn't really mm -hmm. I just knew that I did not want to have things being bothered with like human or others you know? mm -hmm. and so uh, I learned later that those knots in trees you know like those little knots are they would also call those witch knots and that just would keep the spirit tied up essentially busy over trying to work and follow the knot versus doing whatever trouble it might do so it's like a, a superstition right Mm -hmm. that may or may not really have any relevance but I've it's just something that I knew to do and do and so there are some you know I think like with other kinds of traditions I don't know how solid that one is as far as like being really truly effective but it's just something that that you know was part of my family's kind of thing to do you know <clears throat> I follow so not so much direct skill transfer in the family, your mother, other women in the family no. didn't actually sit you down at one point and teach you something. No, no, they never did. <laughs> but there's a lot of there's a lot of osmosis going on. Yeah, it was just that this was possible. That's a really fun way for me to sort of learn uh, was to see what was possible right like oh they can do that oh then I can do that or I can practice that and it's possible like I can make that you know a thing like whereas maybe I didn't think about it before um as a possibility or even you know consideration and then oh ooh, you know and then you can sort of move forward with it and push it and then play with it, you know, like if you can do this, then maybe you can do this, and maybe you can do this, and maybe you can do, you know, something else with it, and then really have fun with it. So, yeah. When you speak about dreaming, God, there's so many questions floating around in my mind. So when you speak about dreaming, I take it that I take you to mean a library of skills that one develops through practice experimentation and working with others that allow you to interact in a non-ordinary way with people, situations, and so on. This is not what most people think about when they think about dreaming, though if they're thinking about the lucid slice, they might associate some skills with that yeah mm -hmm. so help me understand how you would describe what you mean when you use the phrase dreaming in case I left something out or didn't get it yeah well uh, dreaming is like the word car or bird or you know clothing right? It's a very non-specific word that can have a lot of different aspects to it, right? Are you talking about the characteristics of a penguin versus the characteristics of a hawk versus a hummingbird versus a heron? You know, like they all have different specialties or different ways of being, right? Um, so, dreaming for me is that kind of thing too. And so when I hear other people talk about dreaming, I usually take it to mean that they remembered something that happened while they were asleep and maybe they brought it into this world space and time and were able to recall aspects of it, right? So that's what I would call like someone having a dream. And then there is the term lucid dreaming 
which um, I seem to take as when um, someone finds themselves in a dream uh, or in a dreaming state, and that can be either self-induced or just, you know, when it's happening, it's accidental or it's that the, they just are. And then they recognize that they actually have control in that dreaming state and then they choose to do something with it um, or not or just experience it in a more aware way, I guess. Right. So they are um, more they feel more like how they do it when they're awake in that they can actually interact and move as they would as if they were awake in the dreaming space. That's what I would call lucid. Then there's dreaming that um, you can go into a dream with an intent uh, and that in like, say for instance, uh, one of the practices that I learned in my tradition, my shamanic tradition, the maker tradition is mm -hmm. I, if I wanna know what's behind a certain door, um, I can, in this layer, in this space and time, I can go um, and think about that door, set the intent that I'm going to get behind that door in dreaming space. And then when I go to sleep, I find myself in front of that door and then I can open that door and go behind it and see what's behind it. So it allows me to access things that are in my awake space and time mm -hmm. in a dreaming space and time to, you know, to see what's going on. Um, there's dreaming like awake dreaming, which, uh, or what I had mentioned before, some people call it journeying or astral travel. And there may be some shaves and flavors of differences in how people interpret even those things. Sure. So essentially, they're moving their energy or awareness um, and energy. And I would also distinguish that there's a difference between energy and awareness, but they would move their, their consciousness, essentially, um, into some kind of other realm, whether it be um, uh, something that exists, um, just not in this space and time or within a dreaming space, which then can also be a portal to another kind of space. Um, and so that awake dreaming allow is, uh, allows for, um, in my tradition, very powerful um, movements, energetic movements can occur within that space. Uh, other people tend to use and uh, use that as even just um, a way for them to get uh, inner wisdom, right? Like mm -hmm. information for themselves that can be helpful. And that's a lot of people call that journeying, right? And or med like a guided meditation, maybe even that brings them into a place where they can get past that thinking mind for a moment and allow for more of like a, a, a um, a quiet inner truth to come through and allow to speak and say what it needs to say. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I could, dear, and I could go on for a while with that. So <laughs> is there anything specifically that you want to? Yes. Um, about? Okay. So I just want to give people who either don't yet have any experience of non ordinary kinds of awareness while they're awake or they only maybe have a very limited kind, perhaps they've done psychedelics, for example, and they realize, oh, there's other ways that my mind can be mm -hmm. that I can still be in sort of the physical world and see the things around me and interact with them, but my, my awareness is in a different shape, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you're absolutely right about the words, right? We have these words like food. <laughs> well, what do you mean? Like, okay, okay, it's something we eat. Okay, sometimes, yeah. right? But that refers to all the possible kinds of things. So it's terribly general. Um, when you talk about a shift in awareness mm -hmm. and perhaps, um, perhaps something that resembles changing the mode of one's waking consciousness. Mm -hmm. This, ordinarily when people hear the word dreaming, and look, words don't mean things. Words mean, we, dis we decide together what we mean. We use words to mean things to each other, right? Mm -hmm. And right. so that's, that's the weird part where 
what does dreaming mean really isn't even a question because it's what do we mean when we mm -hmm. use money? Right, right, exactly. here, right, right now, right. what do we mean? So <clears throat> um, with the word dreaming, and I don't want to get too hung up on this. Yes, of course, it refers to nocturnal experiences. And then there's the slice of lucid nocturnal experiences. And then there are some other unusual slices of that. Um, mm -hmm. And then with, with waking dreaming, we probably mean something more like um, using our intent, meaning mm -hmm. what we hope to become, do, see, change, right? To enter into, to give our waking yeah. consciousness another layer on top of it mm -hmm. that we can move into in which we can act in non-ordinary ways to mm -hmm. see, to solve a problem, to overcome an obstacle, something like this. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's a broad spectrum of things. I wanted to ask you <clears throat> related to this, have you ever experienced sleep paralysis? I have not. Um, That's and I not too surprising actually. <laughs> I, I've heard of this thing where it, the sleep paralysis, um, but I have not personally had that experience. I also don't have very many nightmares, mm -hmm. um, which, um, you know, I guess that's a common thing that people have is nightmares, you know, and I can only really think of just a few in my whole life. Um, and, and it was, yeah, you know, but it's not a common, common thing for me. Mm. Yes, it's relatively uncommon for me too. Mm -hmm. um, there are some occasional exceptions. <laughs> um, Zoom tight. Okay, so many questions. All right, let's go to... <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, here's one. Uh, actually, I've got a few here. Okay. Um, and these are questions that I often ask just because I'm really curious. And maybe I've asked you these before. Have you ever seen the sun in a dream that you recall? Oh, we have had these conversations. Yeah. Um, I think the answer is still no. The moon? Yeah. Um, I think the answer is still no, but it's a question because sometimes I confuse my awake dreaming and my sleep dreaming and I have seen the moon, uh, but I'm pretty sure it was during awake dreaming. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how about um, a lamp that is on in a dream? And I'm talking about sleeping dreaming. Yeah. Yes, I have. Okay. A candle that's lit. Yep. Okay. Ever tried to turn a light on in a dream? That you remember? I don't recall. Mm -hmm. uh, but there has also been fire that yeah. has been used as a light. Of course. Yeah, fire is not quite as uncommon for some reason. So obviously, <laughs> there's a weird question here. And it's not the kind of question that I'm actually seeking an answer to, right? Because mm -hmm. it's it's such a deep question that I think an answer would be sort of a way of getting a divorce from a question I'd rather get married to, which is what, okay, <clears throat> whatever's going on when we're dreaming seems to be illuminated almost always, but what's doing the illumination? Yeah. And, Right. Of course, we can say, you know, sort of obvious answers like, well, it's consciousness. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, but that's not what I'm after. I, I agree. I agree. Yeah. There's something trippier going on there. And the reason that these questions first occurred to me is because I've had experiences in dreaming where. It, OK, let me ask a different question before I go here. Um, is it very common that you have a dream that you're you're in the room that you're sleeping in? It's not common. It's not common for me. Has it happened? It has happened. Um, 
because of I'll go layers. I used to practice lucid dreaming because I thought it would be, you know, kind of interesting to have control. And I was like, oh, this is super easy. But then I would go, okay, what can I do with this? And then I would do a dream inside of a dream inside of a dream and, and see how many layers I could go. And huh. so uh, it would get confusing uh, because I would wake up in my bed, but I'd still be in my dream. Mm -hmm. And then I'd wake up in my bed, but I was still in the dream, you know, that kind of thing. So right. yeah. layered false awakenings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So often when I have a dream and I'm in the room, I'm dreaming. There is. There's an unusual situation there energetically at least okay um, one of the things i'll say about this is i've noticed that there's something like a structure to the to what i refer to as the dreaming manifold and when i think of this word manifold i just think of a bubble of many bubbles with intersections right mm -hmm. And the dreaming manifold is delicate in that if waking consciousness mm -hmm. enters it in a sort of angular way, mm -hmm. it tends to burst the bubble, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you're, you're running away from a pink tyrannosaur in a 12th century castle. You turn around suddenly and like, why? Wait, what? And that mm -hmm. moment of questioning of both history and also mm -hmm. of identity those are mm -hmm. two of the angular things that tend to collapse the dream, right? Okay. Um, identity is one of the uh, key dream collapsers. So certain kinds of questions in dreaming introduce what I call a granch. <laughs> this is just a word I made up. Right? I love it. I love and it. And a granch is a, a, like a three-way branch, right? Usually okay. one of three things happens. Either the dream will backfill, Oh, well, yesterday you ran into the pink Tyrannosaurus when you were eating, your, you know, right, this kind of thing. It makes up a history that satisfies the sort of intrusive aspect of the waking mind that's forming the question, satisfies it, you go on dreaming. Okay. The second one is like, there aren't pink Tyrannosauruses, this is ridiculous, and you wake up. Right? Okay. <laughs> and then the third one is, it's, it doesn't do either of those things. There's a there's a sort of a between space that opens up that the consciousness naturally steps into where you realize that's not the important question. And I think I'm becoming aware that I'm asleep right now and I'm in a dream. Mm -hmm. So that leads to something, some form of lucidity. Mm -hmm. What happens for me usually when I when I'm dreaming in the room. All right, so I had a dream a while ago where I woke up, I was at a family member's house and I woke up and um, I got out of bed, but I was like drunk. I couldn't walk right. And I, and there was something wrong with my seeing. It, it, I could see everything was there, but it was like something was missing from what I was seeing. Okay. Like the yeah. layer was missing, even sure. though I could still see. So I sort of drunkenly stumble down the hallway to my sister's room. I knock on her door. I go in. She's got a gun. We start fighting over the gun. That resolves. I try to go back into the room, and there's a huge wind just like coming back out of this room in which I'm actually still asleep on the bed. <laughs> And then I get my phone and I try to take a picture because I can see things moving around in the wind beyond the door. Some of the phone doesn't work, which is another common thing. <laughs> so often when I wake up in the room that I'm in, one of the most common features, that was a specifically strange one. Mm -hmm. But one of the most common features is electrical things don't work. Mm -hmm. So once I went to turn on my light over there, which I actually never use, it doesn't turn on. I'm like... Mm -hmm. Well, let me get my flashlight. So I got my flashlight, turn that on. That doesn't work. At that oh, point, I realize I get that the wall thing might not work, but this yeah. doesn't work too. And that leads to an encounter. What actually happens is I go in the hallway and outside my bathroom door, there's a little paper bag, like a lunch bag. And the door is partly open. 
and I reach to open the door. And as I grab the handle, suddenly I'm engaged with like a metaphysically powerful electrical feeling like tug of war back and forth. like there's a giant impossible monster on the other side of the door that could just you know rip my arm right off if it wanted to but is actually just letting me feel its power right okay yeah sure and do you have any experience of a force that resembles that in any experience of something like that of forces that are doing moving like a, like a, an almost electrical mm. kind of like really jiggly is the only word I can <laughs> because I've had this before right like sometimes I'll grab onto a string and the string will start yanking my arms around like this oh. and then boom I'm in some kind of non-ordinary experience shortly thereafter oh cool yeah um I can't think of something in dreaming that that has mm. happened um I may I may have to come back and say oh yeah I remember this one thing but, but it's also like Part of the reason why you might not have this experience is that these experiences are much more natural to you. Mm, that right? could be. So since you're um, in some way very comfortable with them and have long association with them, they might not emerge in such a dramatic yeah. sort of hyperbole, right? Mm -hmm. It's possible. Yeah. I mean, for me, my, like weird stuff that happens in my dreaming time is, for instance, I'll have a dream and I'll be going down a neighborhood and I'll see a building and then I'll actually see the energy of that building in the dreaming and I'll say, oh my God, there's all these symbols and stuff on this. This building is something completely different than what it seems to be in this dreaming space. This is something else completely I want to get in there and see what's in there, you know, and, and then it ends up that it has, you know, I don't know if you remember, um, or have ever heard of that there, they would call them, um, it's probably a derogatory term now, hobo signs. Yes. Right? And so like, uh, folks that are riding the rails, they'll, they'll put some symbols on things to designate, oh, this is a safe place. This is a place where you can get some food. This is a place, watch out for the cops, right? Mm -hmm. And so the, these buildings would have these kinds of symbols on them so that they could designate like what was what. But um, I only saw it, you know, I only see it every once in a while, but it's the energy behind the actual thing, you know. So that's mm -hmm. that to me is like, oh, that's a fun dream, you know, or. Oh, that's if, amazing. Yeah. Or if I'm in dreaming and then I'm like, I see writing, literally writing on the wall and I want to really get a a good close-up of what exactly is on that wall what's written on that wall and i'll move in and the cursive handwriting will change into a different language or something then i'm like oh that's interesting to me you know um there was a period of time where i had been very um conscious in my dreaming of working with another person so they were sort of like a peer to me uh, and the peer, the you know, the other person and I were sort of apprentices in a training. Um, and while we were apprentices, we were sort of given the 101 class to help train these other people, right? Ah. Essentially, so we shared this, this piece together. And so I remember going into dreaming and then finding myself with that person again and be like, oh, what are we doing today? You know, and and you know, like throwing people into the dark, uh, deep ocean and letting them face their fears, for instance, is some is one of those things. Like that was a practice uh, that we just did for like the normal people, <laughs> you know, people. <laughs> so you know, and and we would be like, oh my god, you know, how long are we going to be doing this? You know, like when can we move on to like the two hundred ones? Essentially, we weren't using that kind of language, but. Sure. Like, knowing that we wanted to to go forward and this per, this peer that i have in dreaming we've met over you know 20 years uh and so you know i wonder about that for myself like wow that's really interesting is this actually like um this in this dreaming place and space is this actually another human that i know or you know like 
that I, I don't necessarily know, but I only know them in dreaming. And we, we have energetically connected every once in a while, and we're sort of on the same path with what we're learning and dreaming uh, through whatever thing we're doing. So I find that interesting. That, to me, interests me. Yes, yes. Yeah. yes. So this brings up another topic. Um, we talked a little bit about radio, right? And that before there was radio, or, or let's say telephones, yeah. yeah, that we had naturally humans had these abilities. Yeah. And they were probably pretty common. Yep. Yes, there were people who were much better at it than others, mm -hmm. but everyone had the basic ability. Mm -hmm. yep. I recall a story where an indigenous man was training his daughter. And this is just a story. I don't know the man. <clears throat> but there was a particular kind of candy that she really liked mm -hmm. to eat, and he didn't want her eating it all the time. So he would tell her, you know, I've got a word in my mind. And when you guess the word, you can have the candy. And she's like, you can't do that. No one can do that. You know, this kind of thing. <laughs> and she would make some halting attempts and such and wouldn't get it right. Or maybe once in a while, even though she didn't get it right, he gave her a piece of candy, candy to <laughs> encourage her to believe that it's possible, right? Like you said, yeah, right. oh, this is possible? Wow. And then eventually she became totally adept at it so that the moment he made a word in his mind, bang, she could say the word. Yeah. It can be. Um, we have these words that are very valuating, words like telepathy or astral travel or, you know, where we think, oh, this is some very special psychic skill. If we're willing to believe in that, if we're not completely skeptical about it, obviously there are people like Darren Brown who can completely emulate the things that a psychic would do just as skillfully as a psychic and then show you the exact techniques he used to not be psychic and okay. do these things, right? Okay, sure. So, mm -hmm. so he thinks there's, since there's another way of doing this, that proves that the other thing doesn't exist and is just nonsense, right? Okay. okay. And he's very invested in proving that even though some of the stuff that he does is truly sophisticatedly bizarre. You know, this, is, I'm, this isn't an advertisement for Darren Brown, but he's a fascinating individual to see the kinds of uh, scenarios he pulls, right? Yeah, I'd be yes. interested in seeing what he's up to because I've never heard of the guy, so. Oh, like he gets, um, I'll give you a couple of brief examples. He goes to New York, and buy stuff in stores with blank sheets of white paper. Oh, okay, sure. Mm -hmm. He gets a group of business people who have never committed crimes together at his mansion under the guise that he's going to teach them some of his techniques and scripts them so that later in public, in a city, in a specific space that he leads them to, they will, one by one, individually, rob an armored car. Oh, okay. Right? You just scripts them to, you get these four signals, rob the car, right? Okay. And most of them do. Um, some really crazy things worth worth checking into. Uh, but that's, that's a, a side branch. So obviously before we had television, if you watch families, right? They're sitting there uh, you know, entranced, <laughs> uh, like watching the TV together. We must have had something like group dreaming, mm -hmm. right? Where we went together. I, I feel so. I mean, I but find you've, it. You've done this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean you have, you've done group dreaming, right? Where you have a mission yeah. together or no? I will tell the truth. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. What I think is the difference now between, like, you know, we're talking about hypothetically, you could do this thing or I've done those things. But the truth is that you get real good at it when you have to do it we don't have to do it now right like when if if it's a matter of life or death yes then you're gonna you're gonna invest it in it right you're going yes. to really set an intent push your will and make that happen uh because it could be a matter of life and death yeah we don't have that now and so it's there's no skin in the game uh per se right at least and not so, as much right yes um, the older people's when they lived in on the land and there was desperate trouble. I mean, the winter would kill off a third of your elders every year. 
right? Mm -hmm. So you're highly motivated as a group. You live together every day. You dream together every night, mm -hmm. right? You're in the same place together mm -hmm. with the same yeah. intentions and hopes and fears, concerns, ancestral history, that you've been living, your, your people have been living here for 10,000 years. The mountains are full of your dead, right? It's like the place really matters. One of the things mm -hmm. my friend Mark said was that when he went to Burkina Faso in, in Africa, he was uh, Molly Doma Somme's secretary for a couple of years and knew him pretty well mm -hmm. and went to, to Africa to look around. And he would say, you know, their magic works for sure. Mm -hmm. but it doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. I'm American, mm -hmm. right? Those, those yeah. places where they've been living for thousands of years, I haven't been mm -hmm. there. I've been over here, you know? Mm -hmm. My people don't come from Burkina Faso, right? He would be like, not everything doesn't work. There are people who can make, you know, charms and things that work for anyone. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the magic, especially when he became ill, it didn't, it was very difficult for him to get healed there. He had to come back here to get healed, mm -hmm. which I thought was an interesting side note. Yeah. But I think we were born for group dreaming and we're just not getting the context or the, I guess training isn't the right word. We don't have these traditions, mm -hmm. um, but certainly you have, you have the experience of having formed at least a small team and gone on missions together. Yes, I have Think done. Anything yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and some of the stuff is pretty accessible too. You know, like there's there are ways of learning how to do that. That's not in a closed tradition or a hidden secret that you have to know all these other things before you do it. You know, I mean, I've gone through some of the Harner training and one of the fun things they did is like, okay, remember you've got like this piece of jewelry for this other person go into dreaming space and find that person based on their jewelry. You know, like this is how you could, where you can find um, people who were lost, right? Um, I use a method sort of like having, I'll send a, um, a scout out to spray paint them a certain color and then I can find them based on the spray paint, for instance, right? Uh -huh. So um, there's, it's not inaccessible, but I, the other thing I, I really want to sort of like, bring into this conversation is it's just not people that are doing this group dreaming right um for instance when you're talking about the folks in africa they're they're working with their genius loci they're using all the spirits they're using all of the connections they're having not just a human to human conversation they're having a, a much wider conversation and i feel that that is as important as it is to yip yap with your neighbor, you know, like you need to know how is um, the weather going to be? What is the, where are, you know, if you're in Siberia, where are the caribou hanging out right now? You know, have the seals come in, those kinds of things. And so, and all of those things also talk to each other, right? In ways that we can't really understand. So there, there's a, um, uh, I don't know how to explain it really well, but there's sort of these bands of communication, right? There's the human band that that's this thick. And so humans are more naturally able to communicate in dreaming space and other types of energy with each other as humans, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then trees, and, and again, the word trees, right? They have their own band humans and trees can actually work a little bit closer. We're closer together in that whole schema. And then there's like um, honeybees, you know, and they know how they're each language for each other. And they, you know, they're doing their own dreaming work together and that kind of thing. And, you know, squirrels and, and crows, you know, how do these animals know how to do the things that they do unless they're already connected with all of squirrels of everywhere, right? Hmm. Like, how does a squirrel make a squirrel nest? You tell me if they've never been in a squirrel nest or- Yeah, of course, the scientific answer, which is a dismissal is instinct or, you know, it's in the gene. What is instinct? Yes, instinct exactly. is that it has knowledge. Where does that knowledge come from? Yes, and how does from, it get- you know? Yes, so-, so you're talking about a topic where this is actually the topic that led me to my 
significant long-term non-ordinary experience because I began to think of the layer of the humans mm -hmm. as a fully linked network that's always changing each of the individual humans, right? The network's alive by itself. And then there's a network of the trees and the bacteria and the mountains and the oceans and the sky and the insects. And so each of those beings has a sort of a local cognizium and then their close related cognizia, right? Like the bees are obviously dreaming with the flowers. Yeah. At least. Yep. Um, and and also let's not forget that all of those things are made of elements which then also tie in with, with each other and are connected you know it just keeps going right like right. the macro and the minor the uh, micro macro yes. micro we can connect into all those things as humans we can connect into all those various layers uh through various you know focus and intent and our will right so like but also through relation right, right absolutely give them a gift go to them, go to the trees, give them a gift, pay them attention, sit with them, make a friend or two. Um, if you see a bee on the ground, warm, warm the bee up in your hand yeah. so it can fly again, right? Meet the bee people. You know, you can think of it in, a, in like, this just sounds like a bunch of woo. Okay, if you're about to die and a human comes along and rescues you and saves your life, does that seem wooish to you? Right? If the bee is freezing to death on the cold cement after having lost its ability to move its body fluids because the temperature suddenly dropped and it's dying there and I warm it in my hand, don't you think that makes an actual link, not just with that bee, but with the hive it's from and the entire line of ancestral hives that that queen is from and so on. So yeah, okay, go ahead. If you want to dismiss it as woo, be my guest. You're going to live in a pretty boring world for the rest of your life but and on the other hand there's stuff that it's very useful to dismiss as woo right there's a lot of superficial bullshitty sort of spiritual prostitution for lack of a better word <laughs> right where this yeah. is just you know and and some of that stuff even works because there's some principle underneath it that is being um surreptitiously promulgated so let's say um the secret right to pick one of my favorite examples of bullshit okay encouraging people to believe in their dreams is pretty powerful by itself mm -hmm. right so just encourage you can accomplish your dreams we're here to help you do that that's the underlying thing that's being surreptitiously presented as you have magical power. You can just manifest whatever you believe. You want a million dollars? You can have right. one in a week, you know? <laughs> Pay me 1500 and we'll make that happen. Right, you know? right. Yeah. So there's often principles underneath there, and this is really common in human culture. Um, it's, a, it's a weird kind of virtue signaling, right? Where mm. you take a principle, like we're going to liberate the people who've been oppressed, and then you paint over some rather toxic garbage on top of that, and that becomes taken up by the masses and starts pulsing. And now the cognizium has this form in it. Mm -hmm. um, it's very it's it's very unfortunate and common that something I call thrips, right? These are ideas that become very contagious. Will yeah. have a sort of seed of virtue inside them, but mm -hmm. the actual thing that they're accomplishing is not that virtue, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. sure. And this is tragic and dangerous. So yeah, there's woo. We both agree, right? Yeah, You're, absolutely. You there's You and I both agree. <laughs> I've never had the sense that you were in any way like that. You always seemed fundamentally, authentically who you are and in your practices and your, your workings and your path in a way that just... Um, made me feel immediate respect for you as as a, a deep um intelligent sensitive human being who's exploring and who can see right who has the gift of seeing well thank you uh, it's my, <laughs> yeah thank you right it's so encouraging <laughs> anytime we meet someone who we know we can deeply trust um then we can learn safely together because we have this uh, I've learned so much from you also. 
I mean, I, you know, for instance, in our many years of conversation, I, I will explain something I'm experiencing and you'll be like, oh, well, this is also this and this, you know, and we'll add our, well, be, you know, connecting in this way and you're providing extra context for me and I'm learning with you. We're learning together and we're having, you know, it's just, I really enjoy our exchanges. And so I want to thank, take this moment, right, this moment right here and say thank you for that. <laughs> My pleasure. And yes, I mean, we're much better with another seer than we are by ourselves. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it may be common that people who know me, they think, Darren just walks around seeing these astonishing things all day long, every day. You know, this is just how he lives his life, right? There's a little bit of that going on, but mostly what happens is the spark of another seer, when I'm near her usually because very few of them are male to be honest in my life um it just lights me on fire and now i have the chance to begin to see together for each other it's almost like we need the mission to mm -hmm. light the skills up right mm -hmm. without the mission what do you you could do things with the skills you can form your own mission yes but somehow the mission the mute the mission of like mutual learning and growth and fulfillment and overcoming obstacles and insight right is so um, nourishing and nurturing and encouraging and reassuring and empowering mm -hmm. that i just naturally blossom when i'm next to someone like you right i just yeah. you know it really does end up being a one plus one equals three scenario very really much so yeah. yeah yeah i would agree with you on that um we can either go, I have a few questions that we can't stop without me getting to them. Okay, so can, whatever you need to do. Great. We can either like take a brief like five minute break and come okay. back. Would that be good? Yeah, that sounds fine for me. Okay, I'm just going to pause the recording and I'll be back in like five and we'll continue. Okay, sounds good. I'm just going to mute that for a minute. Great, I'll be right back. So... It sounds really, you and I have discussed the idea of feral humans before. And in, in what context, uh, if you could remind me? Yes, sure. So there are those of us who have either since childhood or since there was a disjunction in our lives, we began to operate outside the culture. Uh, that oh, we, sure. Okay. Right. Like, mm -hmm. and some of us, you know, like I ran away from home when I was a teenager. I lived in the forest for two or three years, mostly inside houses, but also wildly. Mm -hmm. I just left culture. I was like, sure. forget this stuff. I want to know what does it mean to be human? You know, yeah. and you're going to have a rough time figuring that out in the swarming morass of nonsense and pragmatism and money and things. So, <laughs> And you, you are definitely um, a fellow feral in the sense <laughs> that you started out pretty much in a way um, not necessarily opposed to the human culture, but uh, living into your own and your filial, you know, your familial um, histories and such in a way mm -hmm. that really would make you what ordinary people would consider to be an outsider. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we both have this in common and some people are able to preserve certain facets of the many gifts they come to birth with. Um, I think, unfortunately, for most of us, we, we, we enter something like a slaughterhouse in those gifts, right? They just get mm -hmm. snipped off and chopped up and mm -hmm. punished and not rewarded. Mm -hmm. But some people through art primarily, mm -hmm. Um, managed to preserve some of the many seeds that I think we each uniquely carry. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, both, it's one of the tragedies, but also one of the great opportunities that we can help each other to mm -hmm. recover those gifts or start watering those seeds again and realize, oh my goodness, telepathy is nonsense. Humans are transcendent by nature, right? Mm -hmm. Or clairsentient by nature. Mm -hmm. right and this is the problem with Wu is that Wu captures that markets it markets it, it yes money. and you know it's it's almost like the organized we have the same problem with organized religions 
Mm -hmm. There are something, it seems to me, like divine beings, holy beings, it's not ordinary intelligences that are that exist in nature and time space itself and maybe the universe as, as a whole. And the humans are really confused about this because they're like, well, you can go at it via science, which pretty much evicts all that from the first move yeah. and just wants a mechanical grasp on phenomena. Mm -hmm. So that's probably the wrong way of knowing. You know, people keep going like, well, why doesn't science, you know, recognize those of blah, 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 and blah. It's the wrong idea, right? Mm -hmm. That way of knowing is form. Well, it has been now for about a thousand years or 600 years, right? When Rupert Sheldrake says when the division was made and they're like, there are no, there's no metaphysics. We're just going to get a grasp on the mechanics. And one of the amazing things he says about that is the claims in science normally re require evidence. There's no evidence mm -hmm. to explain. Right? Mm -hmm. There's lots of evidence that he has found that I think is reliable scientifically that something else is going on, right? Mm -hmm. um, animal telepathy. Mm -hmm. Anyone who's had an animal, if they don't think that animal's connected with their mind, like something is off, right? Yeah. Um, telephone. But telephone. at Do the same have... time, weren't you brought up? Like I was told when I was coming up uh, that fish don't have feelings, so you can hook them and go fish it, you know, like you, like that kind of stuff. That's what's ingrained in us, you know? Yes. So we are pulled from from our connection as early as possible in all the various ways, even though we instinctively had those things. So. It's true. This is, so one of the um, parts of my practice is a linguistic element. And I think um, language is hugely important for humans in all kinds of bizarre ways that we're not trained to understand. Mm -hmm. But if in childhood, a root principle, like, um, there's a, there's a circle of root principles. Uh, it's not a specific lexicon, mm -hmm. but like, what is the world? Mm -hmm. What are trees? Mm -hmm. What are animals? What is food? What is dreaming? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, what are eyes? Uh, what is a friend? Right. If you go to people and you say like, animals are not sentient. They're just little machines running on instinct. Right. Um, you've broken that holophore in such a way that if that's taken in, even um, superficially, right, mm -hmm. it not only damages that root element, those elements all link together. So the damage in this one is communicated to the ring, right? Mm -hmm. It changes what the world means if animals don't dream, if you mm -hmm. can't make friends with them, right? Mm -hmm. It changes what a friend is. It changes what a tree is. It changes what food is, right? Mm -hmm. It changes what eyes are because we no longer see beings. You know, like in, in, in the Blackfoot indigenous tradition, for example, there are stories where um, a hero, quote unquote, the adventurer is another way, sure. mm -hmm. is taken to the city of the animals where all the animals have like human forms with animal heads. And the animal city is where all the animals dream together and mm -hmm. share um, solutions to problems, including the problem of the humans, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you don't have that idea, if that just seems like a nonsense story to you, then vast arrays of your potential as a conscious being are delimited very cruelly. Mm -hmm. So one of the problems is that science actually damages the holophores on purpose, right? Mm -hmm. It shaves them down to a sort of mechanistic um, skeleton that's dead inside yeah. on purpose, right? It's dead inside on purpose. But it's possible for us through conversations like this and through learning and growing together and adventuring together in our lives to restore, to like re just accomplish a modest repair to the holophore of like what is an insect. And that repair goes around the whole ring, right? All the other elements inherit that repair. So that's a very powerful way that we can restore some of our, um, some of the gifts that we bring to human birth um, as uh, 
if you want to use the word as souls, I think a soul is a complex thing. It's not just one thing, right? It's more like the solar system of many relationships. Okay, yeah. Our souls, our being, right? Mm -hmm. Our incarnate mm -hmm. experience, our animalness, because we are animals too, mm -hmm. and our humanness, and even then our cognition, right? The sort of more structured thing. Um, when I was a child, it was immediately clear to me that the adults were broken. The mm -hmm. adults around me were broken. They thought that small creatures mm -hmm. weren't beings. Mm -hmm. And mostly what you should do with those is just kill them up mm -hmm. as much right. as you can, right? You know, in any way that you can just get rid of those things. Mm -hmm. And that feeds into, you know, a complex mess where the humans are trying to evict ambiguity, right? Mm -hmm. Our houses, do this our cars they evict ambiguity mm -hmm. like very predictable stuff so we don't have our threat sentinel doesn't wake up right this right kind of mm -hmm. um but i i was absolutely clear that small creatures were fully fledged beings when i was a child and that got me in trouble occasionally with other humans especially if i tried to show boys particularly that these beings are beautiful and intelligent and fully fledged beings the boys would just often just kill them sure. you know, just right now because it's a threat to their dominance their prowess their masculinity these are pretty toxic versions of those things but yeah it got got me in trouble um so it is possible to repair these elements and non-ordinary experience is one of the most amazing ways to begin to do that together especially when we're authentic We've developed woo resistance, right? So we're not going to woo out on this stuff. Um, we test what we're doing. We check mm -hmm. it. Verify. I will verify. Yes. So this is something that I love about you is that I know you to be someone who is a careful experimentress um, in that your biases don't lead you to deceive yourself. You check pretty carefully when you're testing a skill or ability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I looking, that. yeah, and and that's something that I rarely encounter, and it's something that I respect about you. Um, it's going to be a bit of a sudden shift here, unless there's something. Let me no, give you no one just a okay. Okay. So, who was the first teacher that really impressed you, and you were like, "Oh wow, now uh, we're on to something together." Um, my Zen teacher, probably. Um, yeah, my Zen master. And, um, I would also say my dog. <laughs> <laughs> my yeah. first dog. <laughs> right. You know, but then that's as a child, right? Yeah. Uh, and my Zen master, when I was in my early 20s, um, just of his way of being and his knowledge of himself and um the way he was he was unapologetic for who he was mm -hmm. and he also taught me about compassion and detachment and how those two could work hand in hand um and uh that detachment didn't mean disassociation um it meant actually being very very present um, but not um, engaged in the story line, right? Like open enough um, to perceive or have the awareness of more than just this piece that you're actually seeing. So I think that, um, but I learned, um, oh gosh, I had, um, I think the, the, the one that really, uh, is inspiring me now is uh, my teacher and mentor, uh, Gary Mills, who is of the maker shamanic tradition, which was originally a closed family tradition, probably starting around 400 AD, somewhere hanging out with the French Huguenots in Eastern Europe. And then the families moved over and ended up actually in Appalachian area and uh, Gary lives in Kentucky nowadays, right? And so uh, he was literally last man standing in his family 
and said, well, this whole shamanic tradition is going to go if I die. My kid doesn't want to do it. It usually went from grandpa to, you know, to or grandpa or grandma to the grandkid. It sort of skipped a generation, I guess, throughout his family. Um, and it was a closed family. So he wasn't, you know, that family wasn't, you know, get your free shaman classes here. And, you know. <laughs> so he uh, made the decision, yeah, I'm going to open this up. And not only am I going to open up this tradition, I'm actually going to make it relevant to today's people. So yes, there are a lot of um, things that, you know, that are older, right? Like, um, but they, they don't hold with today's people, today's contemporary people in the way that they think. So I'm going to take this box of skills and tools and, and fashion it in a form that today's people can relate to. And, um, and I think he's done really well and is, has taught me so much um, and, and provided so much context for me uh, as well. Like, um, you know, things that I just sort of knew or did at, oh there's a this is a good reason why this would be like this or this could even help improve that aspect of it or have you even considered do that's nice that's nice but have you ever done this you know that kind of thing and I'm like oh my gosh yes let's do this and <laughs> and also learning whole new things right and so um my tradition now that I've been in for nearly nine years uh, is the one that I feel um, complements and enhances um, what I, who I am, what I am, what I've known, um, you know, all of that, and, and um, what I hope to be, really. So um, that would, that's my answer for that. Um, please tell us the name of your Zen teacher. Um, so I, you know, Roshi, right? So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was um, a Zen master out of Mount Baldy, California, and um, he died years ago. Um, so I think I have his little book here. Hold on one, one second. Yes, by all means. So Did I ever show you this book? You spoke of this book. And... So it's called the Cent Buddha is the Center of Gravity. It's the Te shows of uh, uh, Joshua Sasaki Roshi at the Lama Foundation, right? Hmm. And so there's this, it's a whole book of Te Show. And a Te Show is essentially like um, uh, akin to a uh, Catholic homily or a, a, a time when someone has a conversation and tells a story and then you're supposed to learn a lesson from it and so when I met Joshu he basically said don't read any books books are terrible you should learn only from your own experience books are a waste of time and then I found this you know he this he this is his book and I said, how about this, you know? And he said, oh, you know, sometimes it's good to read, you know? So I like, <laughs> you know, do the same thing with like, no one should, uh, or you should breathe in through your uh, nose and out through your mouth and in through your nose and out through your mouth and in through your nose and out through your mouth. And literally like the week later, in through your mouth and out through your nose, you know, completely <laughs> completely stalking your position to make you more fluid. Now, he would never use that language, but he knew enough about, you know, how humans are with our conditions of our patterns and our behaviors, our way of being, our awareness and all of that. And he was an expert stalker of, um, you know, finding those places where we become stagnant, not fluid, and, and then twist it, right, to, to bring us back into a place of not knowing, right? Because I think a place of not knowing is really where a place of learning can happen, or a place mm -hmm. of true awareness can happen. Um, and so 
that was, you know, that's that was his, his shtick in, in per se, so. Did he not write a book on the gateless barrier? So um, you're probably thinking of Mumakan's uh, book and and that is the gate, the gateless barrier is part of the Mumakan, which is like a story um, that someone may tell to provide a, like a, like a homily story, I guess is when you, so, but he didn't write that, no. Ah, so I think you gave me a book. So obviously um, in my twenties, I met John Tarrant Roshi. Uh, wild story, I read the book Musashi, the historical fiction of the Japanese swordsman, became interested in Zen, thought I was going to move to Japan, went to the bookstore where the guy ordered the book for me, his name was Ishmael, he's an older guy, he's like, hey, how are you liking Musashi? I said, oh, I really like it, but I think, I think I might sell my stuff and move to Japan and study Zen. He said, oh, you could do that, you know, or you could come back in like 20 minutes and we'll go meet my Zen <laughs> Wait, wait, what, a really? He's like, yeah, like a, a real Roshi? He's like, yeah, a block away, you know, just come yeah. here for coffee and <laughs> so, like, okay. I know that's a typical kind of story about me too. I get wild, effusive dreams and then dream up, you know, crazy schemes to try to accomplish them. And then it turns out that somehow the thing ends up happening, you know, the same thing happened to me when I read Castaneda, for example, I was like, I'm going to go to South America and find one of these old Toltec shaman guys, maybe even find this guy and yeah. embark on the path, you know, yeah. not realizing yeah. that I had already embarked on the path by mm -hmm. having this intention and that wild trips to South America might end up you know, problematical to put it mildly. So yeah. um, you gave me a book, which I love. It's um, Aiken Roshi is John Tarrant Roshi's teacher. And um, he was a man who learned Zen in Japan during World War II, interred in a, in a prisoner of war camp. And he wrote uh, a book called The Gateless Barrier on the Mumon Khan. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And the Muon Khan is essentially a collection of what Zen people call koans. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah. These are really peculiar things because it would be common to think of them a little bit like riddles, mm -hmm. but they're not really riddles, it seems to me. And I've never resolved the koan in my 30 some odd years of Zen. <laughs> I haven't got there. Yeah. But still sits That's not the point anyway, but yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, um, you know, again, it's like that question of what is the source of light in dreaming? This is perhaps my koan, right? Yeah. That, that, yeah. Right? It's not that you want an answer. Um, you, one, I think, desires to have an experience of insight. And insight often involves detachment from narratives mm -hmm. because the humans in general, we're very wrapped up in these mm -hmm. narratives. And I was making a little recursive story there saying like, I got really wrapped up in the narrative of I'm gonna become a Zen student and move to right? Or, you know, I'm gonna go find Don Juan. Mm -hmm. right. um, this brings up the a uh, complex relationship between the maker shamans and the Castanadian traditions, which had very broad and complex penetration into world culture. Mm -hmm. Whoever Castaneda was, whether he was actually someone who was a practitioner or not, is not entirely clear to me after many years of studying his work and knowing other people who walk that path in various ways. Mm -hmm. But the power of his narrative mm -hmm. is profound and penetrates deeply. Um, this book has changed many lives, mm -hmm. uh, not always for the better, I'm, sh I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But there is a complex and interesting relationship between the practices that the maker shamans uh, teach and, and practice. And I'm sure there are layers of those, right? There's probably 
the public layer, the slightly more private layer, the very private layer, and then this is only for the mm -hmm. and sort of deeply initiated folks. I'm mm -hmm. guessing there's a kind of mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, things are sort of unleaved or unveiled over time, you know, and part of that is. In, within the maker training, it's done primarily to keep a person fairly together so they mm -hmm. don't lose their mind, right? Like yes. if you give them all of it, um, they wouldn't know how to integrate it into their daily life and it could cause some big problems, right? Yes, so, even with practices like martial arts, something very similar is done, right? You don't mm -hmm. teach advanced techniques first, people will get mm -hmm. hurt, right? Yeah, it's not an ego thing. It's not mm -hmm. a special cause of this. It's really more... Um, a compassionate act, um, more so than anything else, I feel. So I've asked you this question before, but I'm just curious, why do you suppose there's such a seemingly unlikely link between ancient, apparently, right, ancient South American traditions involving Nagualism mm -hmm. and the makers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I wish I had an answer for that because I have not read a lot. As I told you, I've never read any of those down uh -huh. books or anything. Yeah. So yeah. I don't have maybe the the context that you might have there bring to it to find these similarities and so forth. But I have heard this over and over from other people who are like, oh, that seems like really close to what those Toltecs did that I read in this book. And so, you know, I've I've asked. Um, Gary about, you know, how come there's this um, seeming overlay, you know, kind of thing going on and is what the, are what the, is brought inside those books is, is that, is that stuff true or is there truth in it or whatever? Uh, do you think he really was hanging out with a Toltec shaman, you know, or whatever? And he said, you know, I think he did hang out with um, a Toltec shaman. I think he did, but I don't think he really truly understand what was happening. And he provided his own perspective of what he saw or felt or experienced, and it wasn't necessarily on. So it was sort of like um, somebody who is wearing the wrong um lens prescription on the glasses where they could fairly get an idea but they weren't quite on with necessarily how it really happened and never really could uh find the the truth of it because one they weren't really i don't know like initiated or paid enough attention or practiced hard enough or whatever it was that they just sort of missed it so i i don't have an answer other than how I see, and you may, and many people, pe whoever is watching this too, can see how many traditions, shamanic or otherwise, um, are similar, but use different words or different ideas to represent the same kind of thing. I call it, um, you know, different hands on different parts of the same elephant, right? <laughs> so someone grabs the tail and they describe the tail as having this, you know, long, thin, scaly thing with a little fuzzy bottom. And the other one grabs the tusk and they're like, oh, mine is completely smooth. You know, they're speaking of the same animal, but their experiences are different. And um, but, you know, if they were both holding on to the a leg, maybe then their their language might be more similar. It's still, again, that same elephant. Um, and so I think it might be, you know, the the Toltecs and that form of shamanic tradition from, you know, from Europe, they're both different legs of the same elephant. Um, there really is not like... <laughs> um, huge disparate completely opposite truths you mm -hmm. know about a specific thing there is a generally one singular truth um and and your knowledge or depth of that tr singular truth may shift based on your culture your privilege you know how you were brought up what baggage and beliefs you have you know all of those things your your education all, all of those things um but 
the, tr the, the solid truth, the un really sort of unspeakable truth is that there is one thing essentially there. And so it does not surprise me or concern me. Um, and, and if we looked more carefully at like, you know, the religion of the the San in Africa, or we looked at, you know, another type of um, uh, cultural um, practice that there is the similarity. It's just that we are so um, blind to actually um, bringing that connection together, right? So yeah, does that answer your question? I it guess. does. Um, and this is similar, obviously, uh, you've also studied with Michael Harner. And yeah. mm -hmm. Harner is someone who claims, and I believe him, that he spent many years with a variety of indigenous cultures around the world, and then tried to sort of distill and then maybe shape that distillation for a Western audience. Mm -hmm. um, and then teach. Appropriate. Yeah. Yes, yes, we could, if we want yes. to have a court case about it, we could yeah. have that kind of a court case. I'm not sure that's the most beneficial direction for us to go in. But Yeah, I think he tried his very best to respect um, and care for the cultures that he learned from. You know, he started the Foundation of Shamanic Studies, which essentially um, helped uh, provide financial aid to indigenous shamans throughout the world um, who needed different, you know, literally you needed a tooth fixed and couldn't afford it. The foundation would send that shaman some money to, to help with that, you know, financial burden. So he really did love the people that he worked with, um, you know, but he also was careful about sharing and not sharing um, different parts of information of, sh of the shamanic tr uh, traditions and knowledge that he learned, uh, unless he knew specifically, like if those um, uh, cultures uh, agreed to sharing that information, or if the culture was already wiped out, then he felt that that culture could then learn or be um, provided with more um, you know, open information for the rest it's of the It's a public. very touchy topic, and I just want to, I want to walk through a couple of things briefly. Mm -hmm. The first thing is um, some of the complexities that surround uh, the current craze of wokeness and perhaps political correctness are very bizarre in that, again, we have a situation where there's a, a sort of a, a virtuous seed, but the actual um, cultural phenomenon that's riding on that seed mm -hmm. is highly litigious, otherizing, um, and very complex. Um, it's clear that cultures appropriate aspects of other cultures naturally over time. And this isn't necessarily the kind of thing that we want to punish every time it happens. But there are instances in which that appropriation is egregious and deserves careful attention. Mm -hmm. um, but you also have the problem, like uh, my friend Ryan was saying, an elder came to a classroom where some Blackfoot language and tradition was being taught. And he said, he took the teacher aside later and said something like, you know, you can't teach these things in a school. This is, this is wrong. What are you doing? This is our traditional knowledge. This shouldn't be. And the teacher said, do you see those students walking around the halls out there? He's like, yeah. And ask them what Matoi'i is, the wolf path, right? Because not one of them knows. Our language is dying. Our people are disappearing, right? Our culture is going away. So you want to fight over whether or not it's in the classroom or we just don't, don't preserve our traditions at all, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think the guy kind of saw the, you know, the light, so to speak, mm -hmm. about this. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is common because the colonizing, the colonizing aspects of human culture, which are terrifying and tragic, are mm -hmm. incredibly fierce and profuse and mm -hmm. successful. So they just win. Mm -hmm. Right? There's no, mm -hmm. there's no way around it. They just win. Mm -hmm. So in some cases, um, the only way to preserve the knowledge is to um, acquire the permission to transmit it. 
mm -hmm. of the people from whom it comes. And this is a common part of many traditions, right? There's a formal mm -hmm. transfer of an ability, a skill, a tradition. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. usually part of that transfer is that the person who is transferred to is trusted with it. And they're mm -hmm. trusted to be intelligent about how they share or teach mm -hmm. that. I wanna say a few things about Nahualism very briefly. Sure. Um, so there are a variety of practices that surround what Castaneda was teaching. One of these is recapitulation, mm -hmm. which is essentially getting rid of your life story, right? Mm -hmm. Mostly like de Getting rid of the connections and the, of the energy between the different individuals that are involved in the life story. So you'll still remember the life story. Uh, you just won't have the energetic connections um, or the like emotions that you originally had. You know, so kind of decharging. Yeah, decharging it and um, taking back your energy that was involved in, in those stories and giving back the energy that you may have taken uh, in, in that process. Mm -hmm. There's another feature, which is the um, transparent sizing of the self-image so that I don't just identify with my life story. I realize there's another being there in me, my dreaming self maybe, um, and um, freeing this one up from the traps of the narratives and the other things. And again, this is just me paraphrasing. Um, there are gazing practices, particularly with an obsidian mirror uh, on the belly or a, bo a bowl of water on the belly. There are statues of ancient people who have this bowl of water on their belly. Okay. So it turns out actually means something like the navel of the moon. Um, okay. The gazing downward. And this is part of getting rid of the... Um, the waking world persona so that you can become other forms in your dreaming, right? You can become okay. animals and things like this. Okay. Um, and these are just things I've recently heard and remember from reading Castaneda. Another simple feature was that while we're awake, the not wall sort of in the belly, tonal in the head. Um, when we sleep, these flip over and uh, a practitioner of dreaming learns to accomplish this while they're awake, right? Mm, okay. So the tonal goes down in the belly and the nagual becomes uh, aware while we're awake and capable of interacting with our waking minds. Mm -hmm. Certainly when we were children, we had the capability of a special kind of dreaming that we called play, mm -hmm. but that was very compelling and seems to imply that our dreaming mind was with us while we were awake. Right, yep. because we could immediately yep. switch into play, and the real world was still there. Yep. Yet we were having this completely other experience. We're told you grow out of that. That's bullshit. You don't mm -hmm. grow out of that, right? You can forget it and then re-remember it. Well, it's also the the um, incredible impediment of mm -hmm. representational cognition, picking up language mm -hmm. words mechanical mm -hmm. relationships with objects. That's mm -hmm. not a toy is a thing children hear a million times a day. And children are like, wait, the, the toy isn't a specific thing. It's a way of relating with a thing, mm -hmm. right? right? So how could it be formally not a toy yet the adults will tell them, you know, that's not a toy. Mm -hmm. So those are some things I just wanted to cover for the people who had no uh, previous exposure to, to them. Um, there's something I want to get to, and this is sort of the big gem for me in a way of, of our conversation, if you're willing to share about this. I once asked you if you'd had any experience of fairies. Oh boy. <laughs> Are you willing to share the story? Because it's one of the ones oh, that lives in my heart. I, I will. And, uh, you know, we'll find out what sanitarium I'll be in next week. <laughs> You're too worried about that. That's never going <laughs> No, I mean, you know, it is what it is. So, uh, you you probably want you're probably interested about the fairy story on my land up north, right? Yes. Okay. Um, so first of all, 
I will say that uh, we use this word fairies um, in a sort of bizarre way in, in America, um, maybe, or I'll just say in our culture, um, we tend to think of fairies as being little tinkerbells that come around and, you know, grant you wishes or whatever they're going to do or cause trouble or whatever. Um, but fairies, to me, when I speak that language, basically mean that they're somewhat familiar um, and interactive with humans. Um, and they tend to move into a, into what I'll call this world, right? So we can, you and I maybe uh, can see them without really any kind of like special sensing or anything like that. There are some things that sort of sit just slightly off this world time space and you have to sort of shift your focus, your awareness in order to see those things. Whereas fairies are something that you know, you could be walking through the woods and go, oh, what is that strange thing that I can't quite discern? And maybe that might be called a fairy. So a fairy can, some people may um, uh, confuse fairies with say they saw an alien or they just saw a weird creature or this thing that flew and sort of looked like a bird or whatever it is. But um, for me, uh, I use that term sort of very generally. Um, and it, it means that I'm interacting with things that um, in our normal reality, we don't have words for really, but they're energies that are self-directed, have intent um, and will and can do things and interact with humans. So that I'll just preface all of that. Beautiful. So, okay, all right. So um, I have uh, about a hundred acres of forest and fields and water uh, up uh, in northern Wisconsin, and it, that land borders the national forest. So it's very wild um, out that way. And um, I try to cultivate um, a relationship with that land. Um, it is very wild, full of teeth and claws. And, um, you know, it, I respect it deeply, but I also want to um, have a, a friendly relationship with it. And so one of the things that I did uh, when the oak trees were having um, a fungus, uh, uh, um, invasive fungus called oak wilt come at them, and it was literally killing, killing trees, I went around um, with my sister and uh, provided medicine to all the oak trees in the area. And then I would mark the tree that, you know, what year I did it. And because I think you can do it like every other year or so. And you would literally drill holes um, at a certain height around the tree into the Cambrian so you could insert the medicine so it would be absorbed um, with these huge spring loaded syringes. Um, to push the medicine in, and that should supposedly help. And some of the uh, trees, it did help, and some it didn't. But I had um, decided, I was with my mentor, who can see very well, and who has since passed, but someone that I respected deeply and uh, was very familiar with fairies in the folklore sense. So they were able to say, oh, that's a selkie or that's a this and that's a that, you know, and have names for them and stories behind them and, and so forth. Whereas I'd be like that orange light, you know? <laughs> so, um, so he was with me one night and I had made a bunch of offerings to what the, um, the entities at the, at what I call the crossroads, which is Literally, it's a crossroads of trails, and there's a um, a bunch, a stand of trees, and I I made some, I don't know, probably alcohol and tobacco and honey and candy and um, you know the superstition is fairies like to have shiny things and sweet things, right? Mm -hmm. So if you leave that for them, then they're supposedly happy. And my intent at that time was just to say, listen, I am. Uh, you know, trying to do what I can to help the land. And I sure could use some support from you guys if you're up for it. So just let you know, I'm here. 
my intent is good um, to help these oak trees and anything else you guys need, let me know in, you know, and I'll, I'll do the best I can. And so I didn't really think much of it. It's something, you know, I've, I make offerings and have those kinds of conversations on an ongoing basis. Um, and so my mentor and I were, we spent the day out in the woods and, and, putzing around and stuff. And then um, he's like, you know, we should stay up late tonight and see if we can see some fairies. And I was like, oh, all right, that sounds fine. But, you know, <laughs> I'm an early to bed kind of person. So this was a fine, you're a guest, we will do this kind of thing, right? And so get out there and have all the lights off in the house. Um, my sister is asleep and there, it's completely dark other than the moon and the stars. And there wasn't much moon as I recall, <laughs> excuse me. And so, um, if I recall the first thing that I saw were orange and red lights that were around an oak tree, um, about 50 feet or so, uh, in to our slight left. And so um, I asked him, I said, hey, do you see those lights? And he's like, yeah, I see that. And then all of a sudden, the tree, instead of just these individual lights circling the tree, um, it became that the whole top of the tree glowed in a bright orange color and the branches were dark. So it looked like a reverse x-ray of the tree. Um, and, you know, the whole thing lit up and I was like, okay, that I haven't seen before. That was pretty cool. And, um, my mentor was like, nope, I haven't seen that either. And then the, um, the color, the colored lights of that orange moved into the trees further back in the forest. There was like a bit of a grass opening and then it went into the forest. It went all through the top of the trees and just spread out. And I was like, oh, that is cool. And then it um, also would move around, right? Like, so there would be like a whole bunch of this um, sort of orange thing that would move around. And then it flipped on over into the other forest, which was all pines. So there's a bit of a driveway and then rows of planted pines that were planted about 45, 50 years ago. Uh, by my aunt and uncle and uh, that the whole layer up there started glowing in that um, beautiful orange color and then all of a sudden I noticed that there were it looked like as if and this is gonna I cannot this is gonna sound insane but it's like as if somebody was holding one of those giant movie theater lights that go up in the sky you know what I'm talking about yeah. they come in threes usually right? And they go, oh, this is cool. The matinee lights or I don't know, whatever they are. So if someone had one of those giant lights and they were just sort of winding and weaving their way through the woods, of the pines, you know, going around the pines, like weaving through the pines. So you'd see these lights sort of like moving like this through there. And I was like, very, very bright. And I thought, oh, that's very unusual. And then all of a sudden the light spilled out onto the driveway in the grass. And so this light sort of like came out and instead of being a white light, it formed um, like a straight lined rainbow, which was really neat. So it was like, you know, the red and the orange, yellow, green, blue, and purple. And it just like, whoop, it went out. And I thought, oh, oh my God, that is super cool. So I was like, yay, I love it, you know? and. And I was just, it was very fun for me personally, because I could verify in real time with another person who could see that this was actually happening. And our only question was, is this something that everybody can see? Or is it just something that people who can see can see? You know what I mean? Like, we sure. can't do that. Um, but I, it looks so much like it was in this layer. Stuff in other layers tend to have like a bit of a um, like a vibrational haze to them, I guess is the best way to explain it. So you can sort of tell at night it's hard though, because um, things are, it, it just is harder, like driving down the road and you're like, real, not real, real, not real. You know, like, uh, is it in this layer, not like this layer, this layer, not this layer. That's why I say real, not real is sort of my shorthand for, should I worry about it? It's real. <laughs> should I not worry about it? It's not real, right? Right. And so <laughs> so it was kind of like, wow, this is so bright and so 
um, vibrant and moving that it it would it had to have been in this. When I say this layer, I mean like you could see it. You know, like mm -hmm. everyone can see it. It's a shared experience. Uh, and then um, they these lights also and this so that would happen for a while and then we all of a sudden i'd noticed something over here was going on and there was a tree that um was across from the house that was a pine tree that was actually split into sort of like a staying so it was one um main trunk and then the trunk split into like a u right and and part of that was um broken or um mangled or something so like it, it was not well it was a sick tree hmm. and so um when i looked there were these like probably i don't know if i can show this in here is about this wide about this you know like this circ this diameter it looked like a, a super bright flashlight of, about that size that was like squiggling back and forth on the tree up and down up and down where the wound of the tree was hmm. and at that point, I was like, okay, somebody is seriously fucking with me. So I'm going to go and, and I looked behind because, it, you know, maybe somebody in the house was like doing a flashlight because it was just so bright. Uh, no, the house was dark. And I'm like, oh, so that light was happening, but is very interesting, Darren, because the light didn't look like it came from anywhere. Hmm. I assumed that it came from back there, but there was not like um like a light beam that happened, right? Hmm. So it was just the light was on it, and I, and so I I just want to point that out as maybe you can chew on that for a while when it comes to your dreaming stuff. So, <laughs> <laughs> but so that happened for a while, and then there were the light there were a series of red and blue and orange lights now i am familiar very familiar with those lights they're and they're very common um uh in rural areas i feel at least my experience like farmers when i grew up knew about those lights and they would swirl around the tractor as they're working at night and things like that. I've heard stories about that happening. So those lights have never bothered me. Like I just call them fairies, right? Mm. Like, oh, that's the fairies, whatever. And they they never do anything. They're just sort of like, they to me, it seems like they kind of like machinery. So they were buzzing around my back of my car. But I noticed as I was looking at, they lit up the um, they were so bright you, you could see the license plate number on the on the car mm -hmm. and that that I noticed I was like oh they are kind of bright you know but just another kind of like put it in your pocket and save it for later kind of thought but then there were um there was and this happens with um what people call ghosts uh ghosts come in different flavors from my experience. They can be an actual sort of put together entity um, that that has it or seems to have a kind of intent, um, or it can sort of be like a residual kind of uh, energy that sort of repeats itself over and over and over. So, you know, like um, the ghost that you see that walks the hallway but never leaves that hallway that to me or you know comes out the wall and walks over there and then disappears into the wall and it does it every night at 11 o'clock or whatever people say i call that residuals mm -hmm. it's not really necessarily a ghost it's just the energy of that person sort of still hanging out and doing its thing because that's what the energy does mm -hmm. so um so fairies sort of have a little bit of weirdness to them in that way where there was something that um god the description of it's just going to be ridiculous now that i but think about it. you don't have to do that you just say <laughs> just say what you say please we trust you. so it looked like essentially it was about maybe three feet long and sort of like a caterpillar with a lot of little feet and then it had a cat face to it and it would walk across um, uh, an area and then make a right turn toward me and my mentor and then make another right turn away just like like 
inches away from us and then, you know, move off. And then it would come back and do the same thing. So I don't, I couldn't tell if it was like the same being or just multiple beings, but they also followed the same pattern or whatever it was, but it would all, they would all move just like that on those right angles and, and come right up. And then at one point there was one that came right up to my face and it was like, oh, holy shit, you know, and it had um, a very grotesque kind of cat-like face, but almost, I don't know what to explain, how to explain it really, but it was pretty freaky. And my mentor was like, um, yeah, don't be scared. Don't show fear. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> At the same time, like, oh, I haven't seen that, you know. And so, <laughs> <laughs> so my sister can see. And she um I told her, you know, we told her about what happened the night before. And she's like, oh, I want to see him, you know. And so the next night, um, she and I went out there at the, about the same time. By that time, my mentor was gone. And she and I came and the one came right up to her face too. So there's still, you know, I don't think it's like a anything to worry about I don't feel threatened by it there's not like an um an omen and it's pretty clear that what I gained from that experience the night before with when that flashlight was that kind of you know those two zigzag lights that were going on that broken tree that was a really clear indication to me that the spirits of the land were saying hey you know just like you're doing your part in this world to take care of those oak wheels we're doing our part too and we're just showing you that we're doing our part to help with um caretaking the land as well and so it was like a reciprocation of um, our communication. That's all, that's all of really what I gained from that whole time in that I felt privileged enough to see how they in their own way were, um, you know, providing care for that area of land, that all those other entities and that they brought me in to let me see that to, to, you know, like, see, we're all in this together, essentially, is what I gathered from it. Now, that's my human perspective on that experience. But my heart felt like I would not have seen such an extensive, I mean, this was several hours long of, wow. of uh, I would not have had that experience, had I not done the work that I've done formed the communication and the outreach and and been compassionate um uh you know about my experience for what I was doing with the land so yeah that's my story mm, I love that story <laughs> it just seems um both deeply beautiful and profound and also like truly magical to me yeah know? I've never heard a tale like that in my life. Yeah. And, it, and something of the spirit of the event, I think, comes through, you know, when you tell the story. Um, <laughs> nothing, the, none of those things you're concerned about, those aren't even relevant. <laughs> just, this is life experience. You're there with a teacher, a mentor, your sister, mm -hmm. the wilderness. <clears throat> and I think... Um, the sort of the child in me thinks something really beautiful about this. Like she saw the nocturnal procession of the fairies. Like they were, oh. you know, they were dancing and doing their, yeah. their, their celebration. And mm -hmm. it just seems incredibly found and beautiful to me. Um, and I'm so grateful that you're willing to share that. Oh, thank you. Um, I would like, I hope that we can, uh, maybe do another interview again sometime very soon because there's so much more I would like to learn from you and, and hear from you. But for those people who are trying to learn to grow their capacities for dreaming and seeing, mm -hmm. what would you recommend for anyone who's like still pretty inexperienced or maybe yeah. has tried a couple of things and not really found something that they trust yet any mm -hmm. advice that you would have would be really useful 
Yeah, so I do a monthly shamanic drum and journey circle in my community. Uh, it's a free event that where I teach people how to do what you're suggesting or what you're mm -hmm. asking about. And one of the pieces of advice that I offer is um, use a sonic driver, um, like a drum. Uh, a drum works pretty good to help bring us out of basically your your mind, right? Like your thinking mind. And um, if it's running at a rate, um, if you go on the on the internets and they say, you know, shamanic drumming, it's usually at a rate about um, 180 to 220 beats per minute, which then flips your brain waves to a theta state, which allows for more of this closer axis of a dreaming state while mm. you're awake. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very helpful for relaxing people and putting them in the place of where they can be to get to that place of um, that uh, journeying, right, or active dreaming space. Um, so one of the biggest pieces of advice that I offer the people that come to the circle is pretend you're five years old again, right? Be open and curious and playful forget about whether or not you're doing it right, forget about how you look, forget how weird this all is, and just explore and be playful and creative and, and curious with no expectation of what it is and to just go for it, right? And to have this experience, allow yourself the privilege of just in, being innate, right? Just going back to that time where you 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 didn't know anything and you just experienced for the love of experience, right? Just to learn. And if you can bring yourself to that place, and, and I, I would suggest if you don't remember how to do that, go get a picture of yourself when you were five years old, four years old, three years old. Take a look at that kid in that picture and, and pull up those memories and that'll help shape you to shift you into that kind of position that you need to be in for that work. And then have an intent. Uh, so, and it doesn't matter what your intent is, just as long as you have one. Um, something like, I would like to explore this, you know, other world, or I want to visit with my great grandmother who passed away, or I would like to meet with this being in their own way. I want to meet with the whole ancestral trees of the oaks, right? I want to, whatever it is, I, it doesn't even matter. And then allow yourself to go and do that. And don't get hung up on whether or not you're doing it right, or if you're making it up. Um, many people, adults, are like, well, I'm just making it up. I don't really know how to do this. And, I, you know, I could have thought of that. You do this a few times, and I promise you something is going to happen where you are going to say to yourself, I would never have had the idea to think of that or to come up with that information or whatever it is. They will surprise themselves because then they've got that link. So when they get that link, the next time that they go for it, they'll have a better time at it, right? So like if they meet up with, I don't know, some owl or an oak tree, or they want to see the underground river beneath their house, whatever it is, they can get to that place easier because they've already made the first energetic connection mm -hmm. and the second energetic, energetic connection to that place. And that'll make it easier for them. But I always suggest have an intention and when you get lost or kind of confused or you're feeling dumb or whatever it is, go back to your intention, repeat that to yourself and, and try it again and not to give up immediately. You know, adults, we're always trying so hard and we're hard on ourselves, right? So I can't do it. I don't have the ability. Yes, you do have the ability. I can tell you every person that I've worked with it may not have happened the first time, but I can get them there and they can get themselves. Well, they're getting themselves there with my guidance, right? Mm -hmm. They're doing all of the work. They're finding the information that they want to get. They're meeting the beings they want to meet. They're doing the work that they need to do. They're doing their own self-healing, whatever it is, um, they can do it. And, and I believe it's inherent. It's inherited um, into every human um, that they have this power to do this. So hold on to that possibility. 
like we were talking about before that, oh, if I know I can do it, or if someone else can do it, I know I can do it, right? Like there's a path to it. Please know there really is a path and it's accessible to every person, regardless of whether or not you grew up in a spiritualist or, you know, uh, whatever kind of culture that you have, everyone, you know, originally, everyone, their lineage goes back far enough, everyone had that connection and can reconnect. I truly believe that. Uh, I, with all my heart, I believe mm -hmm. that every person can reconnect to everything again, you know, to not only other humans, uh, and the whole humanity thing, but also to the elements and to the um, the insects and the plants and the and the birds and the mountains, all of it. Um, it is possible, and beyond that, you know, to ancestors and and other worlds and things like that. We really can do this. Um, so that that's my suggestion. That's brilliant. <laughs> that's brilliant. Yes, I think. Um... Uh, we have the idea of like a human library, but we don't yeah. realize there's a living library and we're not just surrounded with it. We belong to it. We're made of it. Right. And so there's all of this um, momentum just waiting for us to open the window, you know, open the door, yeah. walk a few steps toward it and that the library will meet us according to our heartfelt intentions and our, our authenticity, right? It will come mm -hmm. to us. And it's yeah. nothing, it, it's more than all the fantasy stories that like Alice in Wonderland <laughs> is kind of boring compared to what's actually yeah. alive in the yeah. world, even though Alice is a great trope. Yeah, I also want to make a mention and please for anyone who does, you know, kind of journey work or whatever, and if they, have an experience. Don't go looking it up in a dream book to, for what it means. Don't go looking it up on Google for what does a yellow butterfly mean. Don't don't be doing any of that stuff. That that means nothing. It will not relate to your personal experience. You are unique in the way that um, you have your own connections. You have your own uh, um, beliefs and patterns and behaviors and and relationships and so forth. So how you feel that connection or that thing brings to you that is yours and and don't let anyone take it or persuade you that it means something else please don't ever do that that's a it's imperative that that um be known for every person that does this kind of work there is also a really important distinction between the public and the private that you've just highlighted right some experiences um the waking mind is the pretty much the wrong thing to hand off a dream to, right? Yeah. It's going to dissect the dream in a surgical mm -hmm. kind of conceptual way. Yeah. And the dream is its own innate universe. It's, you know, yes, there are, um, there are skillful methods of interpretation of dreams and so on, but our non-ordinary experience is sort of, it withers under the harsh light of examination, analysis, and explanation. And it mm -hmm. flourishes in the living light of wonder and awe and adoration and curiosity. Mm -hmm. So there's something- I'd also like to point that, you know, every shamanic practitioner who's worth their salt will have a completely de different lexicon for their knowledge than um, the next competent shaman. Mm -hmm. So what um, a black cross means for, for one shaman, it is something else for another one. And so every shamanic practitioner who does real serious work has their own personal language and lexicon symbols and things like that, that does not necessarily translate to anyone else. So um, it also relates to people who aren't in a deep shamanic tradition that please just hold and learn your own lexicon um, mm. because that is um, it's imperative that you trust yourself 
and and how you relate to this world. Everyone relates to this world differently. Everyone ha can have the exact same experience and then speak of it in you know their own completely unique way. And they're all right, right? Mm -hmm. So they're all using different words, but they're all right. So keep your own words is what I'm saying. Mm, beautiful, yes. Mm -hmm. If um, someone would like to learn more about um, you or your practices or the makers, is there a, a good way that you're comfortable with? Yeah, I'm fine. I mean, the, the maker shamanic tradition is not closed anymore. It's open for business, basically. Like you can learn about it if you want to. You're going to spend a hell of a long time learning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, you know, if you get involved in uh, learning the tradition, literally, you know, the first one and a half, two years is self-healing. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of work involved in it. And then it goes from there because, um, the Gary Mills, who is, you know, the primary teacher of that tradition um, for what is open um, is doesn't, you know, wants healthy people doing healthy work for to make other people healthy, essentially. And so that doesn't happen unless you do you clean your own closet first. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um the website that people can check out is called shamanscave.com and that's it. It's not the Sandra Ingerman podcast. It is its own school. So shamanscave.com and it talks a lot and there's a lot of information. I think there's, um, I don't even know how many articles There's so many articles, but it speaks about not only the maker tradition, but things that you can do for yourself to, uh, for your own, starting your own self-healing and starting with like a basic uh, recap uh, exercise to um, what, um, what's the difference between Reiki and shamanic healing to, you know, like there's all kinds of questions. Uh, there's stories, there's basic information and um, fun stuff in there, you know, that uh, you can access for free. And then if any of that intrigues you, then you can sign up and it's live classes that are taught. Um, there is exercise, there are exercises that you are expected to practice and report back on. Like this is real world stuff. There's verification. There is you know, um, communication, it's um, primarily, it has always been an oral tradition, right? So there's nothing really written down. It was just people who taught each other. And then um, for Gary, for instance, he was taught since he was a very small child until I think he was like 16 or 17. And then he basically learned to fly with the knowledge that he got from his grandfather at that point. So um this tradition is complete and made um in a fashion now for people um of today you know like this tradition is mm -hmm. stems from thousands of years ago but that stuff doesn't translate well into today's world and so how can we make it actually applicable for people in today's world and that's what you have now with the maker uh they call it the contemporary shamanic tradition mm -hmm. it make a it'll make a lot of people mad because it doesn't use um spirit guides and fancy flying animals or anything like that it's all really um, your own power and energy and learning to accept the responsibility of your own power and energy and cleaning your energy so it can be useful and uh, so you can move energy so it's it's very very uh, intense and good you know like if you're truly interested in um, you know doing energetic work in the world you mentioned that you run a drum circle Mm -hmm. it's free yep. and where yep. is that that's in my hometown of uh, Milwaukee it's once a month and um you know people come from any shamanic tradition or no shamanic tradition whatsoever uh, you know people who are just interested in what I you know my my motto is discovering and trusting your inner wisdom basically so 
just coming in and trying something new. Maybe they heard about something, they have um, an actual specific problem that they need to resolve, then they I give them the tools on how to do that. And it's in a community-based format. So, and it's, while I'm the circle keeper, I am not necessarily the the leader, right? The whole group acts as the leader and um, is very supportive of each other. And it's a collaborative effort. Um, and it's a place where people can be vulnerable and share mm -hmm. and respected and that they trust that what happens in the circle stays in the circle. Mm -hmm. So people can do some really good, hard, difficult work actually talk about it, you know, and, um, you know, feel like they are doing some good self healing. How would someone uh, connect with that circle? Yeah, so uh, I have a website for it. It's, uh, right. um, let's see, it's drum journey circle uh, dot squarespace dot com. I never ended up getting my own domain because I never thought that this whole drum circle thing would fly. And here I am eight or nine years later, I'm <laughs> still doing it. So <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe I'll get rid of the that Squarespace. <laughs> I'm happy to help you out with any of that. It's useful. Thanks. <laughs> um, do, you, do you practice for others? What does that mean? Or what, are, what does that mean? If yeah, someone yes. needed help with something, could they reach out? Now to I do. Now I do. Um, I have always been of the mindset that um, I, my intent or my focus was always other than human focused. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of environmental work. I did a lot of death walking, death doula type of work. So they're not living humans, but um, my mentor... Um, feels he wants me to do more real in-person, um, per, you know, personal human uh, healings. I have been doing, um, and I have, and I have um, a fair actually where a couple other makers are coming into Milwaukee and we're going to be doing healing of for like seven hours on a Saturday or something and just bam, 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 bringing in people. So uh, doing some healings, that'll be fun. And then um, I will start doing more one-on-ones with people uh, in the in next while and till a few thousand people and we'll see how that goes. And then, <laughs> you know, but I've been doing, I've been working with the, because in my tradition, you're not allowed to even think about healing other people until you're about six years in of, of study. And then after that time, then you can sort of um, uh, learn, you know, sort of like um, internship, I guess, with uh, other uh, makers in their uh, healing lab, which is like a, a, a distance or online healing lab kind of. Product. So there's like eight to 10 other shamanic practitioners, makers who are working with uh, to heal the same person at the same time. So mm -hmm. as a group collectively, they get together, they discuss the client, they go see what they're seeing at the client and then um, make a plan on what needs to be uh, healed and how to do it. So um, yeah, so I've been doing that for a couple few years and um, now doing more in-person kind of feelings as well. And how would someone reach out to you about that if they were so inclined? Say they could just contact uh, info at drum drumjourneycircle.com. I'm going to be working on something more formal because I also have a death doula compo component. And um, yeah, I've trained, uh, have my death doula certification and am a member of Inelda and things like that. And I do do some death doula work right now. I'm, I've got uh, a client who is 
not actively dying, so I'm not working as closely, but when he's more actively dying, then I'll be working closer with him, for instance, and then um, working in hospices, and then I'm part of the No Veteran Dies Alone program with the VA that I work at, so um, I'm not necessarily um, doing uh, energetic work unless it's requested or asked for. I'm not pushing my services on anyone unless they energetically or you know speak that they want that kind of work because not everybody wants it you know yes. and frankly if you are working shamanically with people some people don't like to have their energy mutzed with by other people or they don't like to have the idea known to them that you know when I'm looking at a person energetically I'm also seeing their history, I'm seeing their different layers, I'm, I see their seminal events, I see where their trauma sits, I see, you know, things that they don't even see for themselves or want to speak about, and would be mortified if they thought that I had an inkling of it. So that kind of work is a little, you know, got to be careful with it, you got to be tactful with it too. So, um, you know, just because you can see it doesn't mean you need to talk about it necessarily because the person might not be able to accept it or doesn't know about it or can't integrate it well, but you can still work with it. I understand. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Any thoughts <laughs> before we wrap up for this evening? No, thanks for your time tonight. I had fun <laughs> talking about this. It went on longer than I expected. <laughs> But um, I'm all right. No, no, I mean, I've got another another hour in me easy. <laughs> and I, I definitely want to get together and do this again, because I have so much more I want to to ask you and learn with you. So I am yes. so grateful to you. I love you dearly. Thank you so much for coming. All right. Well, thank you so much. It was great getting connected with you tonight and sharing with you. I just really appreciate you being in this world and doing what you do and who you are. So Thank you for that. Much love to you. Much love. And, and to yours. <laughs> yours. We'll talk soon. All right. All okay. right. Take care. Um, I'm going to email you something, but I'll text you about that in a moment. Okay. Sounds great. Thanks. Okay. All right. Bye-bye right. for now. Bye for now.